Hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, along with my beautiful wife, Janet, and we are going to be discussing how medication alone cannot treat diabetes. Now, I'm going to get some definitions out of the way, first of all, um, and some people aren't going to um, necessarily agree with me when I talk about treatment of diabetes, but there is a type 1 and a type 2 diabetes. Um, Janet, will you go ahead and define the difference? Well, the first difference is type 1 is not something that is exactly caused by lifestyle per se. It is something that uh, requires that insulin is added to the body because the body, for whatever reason, is not able to produce enough insulin to um, take the nutrients into your body or the glucose in. While type 2 is that your pancreas is taxed and you've caused it with lifestyle and you're not able to take the glucose or even make the insulin and you're just inflamed. So there's there's really differences that way. Um, and Sean's going to get into the definition of diabetes because I think if we define what it means, that will make a little more sense as well. Yeah. And just a little bit more on type 1 and type 2. Type 1 diabetes, even when I was in pharmacy school 30 years ago, was being changed from the definition of uh, juvenile diabetes right. to type 1 diabetes. And um, then type 2 was called adult onset diabetes. And now it's called type 2 diabetes. One of the reasons they changed that is because there's such a poor lifestyle in children now that many children are getting type 2 right. diabetes. And again, type 2 diabetics have enough insulin. It just doesn't work well enough. Right. Diabetes, when I specifically say diabetes and we're talking about, you've maybe heard it called sugar diabetes, um, diabetes mellitus. Type 1 and type 2, that's what we're talking about. And literally in Greek, diabetes mellitus means honey siphon. So um, uh, basically what it means is you are urinating out honey. You're urinating out, out glucose. So whether you're type 1 or type 2, you are peeing out extra glucose. Um, it just manifests differently in, in why um, that's happening. So... Um, and this is where a lot of people disagree with me because they think I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to type 1 versus type 2 diabetes. But the title of our podcast today is Medication Alone Cannot um, Treat Control Diabetes. And that that is type 2 or type 1. Right. It does not matter. No matter what the dietitian at the hospital tells you, no matter what your doctor tells you, when, if you're a type 1 diabetic, you can't eat everything you want and expect to control your diabetes, period. It's not about turning your insulin pump up or using a longer acting insulin or using more insulin or using faster acting insulin. It's not about that at all. You have to control your diet, Janet. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that is kind of a misconception, I think, in our society today is that if you call somebody out on their diet, then you are, you're shaming people. It's not about shaming when it comes to healthcare or actually wellness care. I mean, let's define that wellness, right? So we have family member that has type one diabetes and you have to control the problem. And the problem comes down to two things for, for a type one, how much insulin your body is able to produce on its own or how much insulin you are having to inject. But where it comes really boils down to is how many carbohydrates, which are sugars that you are consuming and you cannot get away without watching how many carbohydrates you're consuming. And it doesn't matter if you're a type one or type two on this issue, because just because you consumed 300 calories, for example, and most of it are carbs, you still have to deal with the sugar that your body cannot respond to or deal with. So then you would have to give more insulin. So, right. so the reality of it is diabetes, type 1 or type 2, we just described that. It's a carbohydrate metabolism problem. Correct. Period. Um, they are treated differently or manifest differently in the body. They don't necessarily be, need to be treated much differently, honestly. Well, that is, that's not true because type 1 does need insulin. Right. Um, type 2, you do not need insulin. No. In fact, you have too much insulin. Right. So if your doctor, if you're... 
um, healthcare practitioner is prescribing you insulin and telling you you need insulin, you need a new doctor. I'm, I'm serious um, because that is not. It is like putting giving insulin to a type two diabetic. It's putting gas is on a like fire. putting gasoline on a house fire. Seriously, you already have enough insulin. What were you going to say, Jan? Well, in, in the case of a type 2, your body is not responding. You're resistant to the insulin that your body's making. So that's why we're saying if you add more insulin to the issue, you're just putting more gasoline there. It's not that your pancreas can't produce the insulin. It's that your body is so inflamed it doesn't know how to respond to that hormone. And let's, let's really be honest. It's a hormone that's being triggered by your body to be released into the system. So the way you control this is with what we put in our mouth and our stomach. And it's not about being rude and it's not about judgment. It's just being very honest that you can't keep putting sugar and insulin into your body and expect results because those results that you're going to be, that you are getting are not being healthy for the outcome that you would like to achieve. And personally, it's not about judgment here. I mean, because I think that's one thing that I've seen over social media and over time is that you're judging people. No, we're telling people that the tool that you need to achieve the outcome is to lower the amount of sugar you are consuming in your diet. Because if you can lower that, then you aren't needing to have these interventions that have side effects to them. And one of the things that we haven't even talked about yet is that when we put somebody on a medication for lowering their glucose, or if we put them on the hormone insulin, guaranteed you are going to gain weight. That's not what we want. And not so much with the type one, is that a problem? But for sure, for a type two individual, we don't want to put any more abdominal weight or weight on your body. No, insulin is an anabolic hormone. Like Correct. Tana says, the peptide hormone, and it's anabolic. It takes glucose out of the blood into the body to be utilized, which means it will make you grow. It right. will make you get bigger. And if you look at originally when they diagnosed diabetes back in the 1920s, um, these children were dying, basically getting really, really skinny and not able to absorb their nutrients. And they would die basically from starvation. Right. Um, and so insulin, and, and you put them on insulin and the first kind of insulin was, was beef and pork insulin, basically isolated, ice, isolated from cows and pigs, pancreases. Um, they would start gaining weight immediately. Which actually was a life changer. It, it a saved life saver. Life, right. For, for those individuals. And you know, when you look back in history, type one wasn't as, um, it was more prevalent than type two. And it wasn't that, that much of the population had type one. Um, I think that that has increased over time, but type two now, when we're talking about even children is a problem in the United States. And it's not usually a third world problem. It's a problem in countries that have an abundance of food. And that's basically what it is. You have an abundance of calories, and that's what can cause type 2 diabetes. Um, there are some ways, other ways. So the, I sometimes wish that the type 1 and type 2 weren't even both, need, both of them weren't called diabetes mellitus. But because of what happens with the um, blood sugar in the urine, that's why we call them diabetes mellitus. But um, – I wish they weren't because they need to be treated so differently, honestly, um, except they are both carbohydrate metabolism problems. But we're really good in healthcare about finding a number to treat. So right. we say, oh, your glucose is on over 100. That means you're you know, pre-diabetic. If it's over 125, whatever, you're diabetic. So we're really good at trying to say, okay, well, here's a number. What do we need to do to lower that number? And so we've created all these fancy drugs to help get those numbers down, whether the sulfonylureas back in the 1960s, um, they were help, they would help the pancreas stimulate, they would help stimulate the pancreas to produce insulin and release insulin. They worked well, they worked okay. Um, but your pancreas would tax out after a while and then they wouldn't release any more insulin so that you kind of got tolerant to them. But there again, you're releasing insulin, which right. is putting fire on the field or, or gas on the field because your body's not responding to what you're already making. 
And now fast forward, you know, 60, 70 years later, and we have these fancy drugs to help us urinate out the insulin. I mean, the, 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 the glucose. So we lower our glucose in the blood by making our kidneys urinate it out. Okay. Well, I got, talk, Janet I, I, loves this one. This, this infuriates me because the problem with diabetes is that you can't handle the glucose in your system. So let's let's urinate. And, and this theory with these drugs is let's put the glucose out through your kidneys. Well, folks, if you're putting glucose out through your kidneys, you're, you're damaging an organ that you need to eliminate toxins and fluids every day. And there are people with the side effects. And, and to me, I don't even know how these drugs can stay on the market because yeah. it is it is sad to hear the stories of how, oh yeah, I got this infection. No kidding. If you're putting sugar and glucose in somebody's kidney and they're urinating this out, of course the side effect or the long-term problem is going to be an infection. And then they're not simple. I mean, a lot of these people, if it's ongoing, will end up in a hospital. It can be very serious. So these side effects or urine, urinating out or just getting rid of glucose just by peeing it out is not a smart way of handling glucose no. in your body. In fact, if somebody would have said to this person, perhaps if we ate differently, i.e. we stopped ingesting just sugar and started doing something like increasing the amount of proteins and fats, still controlling our calories, but increasing foods that didn't cause the problem of the increased glucose in the blood, then that would be a better solution because you don't have the side effects of the problem of using these drugs. Remember what I said about what diabetes mellitus means, honey siphon? Remember, per definition of diabetes mellitus, you're peeing out glucose. And that's how we used to diagnose diabetes before we had blood tests. But now we have these great drugs to Thank help you. you pee out more glucose. I mean, talk about how silly that is. And 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 I'm sorry, but pharmacists and doctors and pe people in the healthcare no. profession that buy off on this, it's completely no. wrong. It's not fixing the underlying problem. Sure, will it lower blood glucose? Yes, but look at what it does. It's getting sure. glucose higher in your sure. urine, sure, which sure. is the way you, we used to diagnose diabetes mellitus. So here, here's why we are so frustrated with this, is because if you put into our small vessels called capillaries, the molecule of sugar, it is a crystal. You're putting a crystal through your kidneys, which have small areas that this is supposed to go through. Microtubules. So you are causing small crystals or bigger crystals to go through a small area. So you're causing long-term damage. That's usually why people, if you, if you hear about people that end up having um, blindness from diabetes or they're having a kidney transplant or they're having to have remove a appendage such as their foot or their leg. It's because those crystals that have came from sugar are damaging those tissues at the small level. So why are we acting something else that's going to damage a tissue that we already know we need to survive? It's crazy. It's crazy. So before Sfania is in the 1960s, there was people with type 2 diabetes. Rarely. Um, and, and so what did, what did physicians do back then to, to treat diabetes before we had these magic great drugs to treat diabetes? What'd they do? They had an honest conversation and talked about diet. And folks, your pet is being treated better than you are. When you take a pet into your vet and there's a problem, whether it's diabetes or whether it's heart, or whether it's joint or what, whatever condition we're, we're talking about, the conversation of diet comes up and it's not about judging you as a pet owner or judging you as a person. It's being responsible and talking about what needs to happen to get a positive outcome, a long-term solution, not a band-aid, not a fix. And yes, you might have to choose differently, but would you rather choose something that is going to help you long term? Or do you want to live in that moment and say, oh, you know, I need that fixed right now. And, and personally, you know, whether it came to my kid, my husband or my pet, you know, I want long term. I want the best for them. I want them to live a long life as best as they can. 
And so that's why we talk about this. It's not about shaming. It's about telling you what tools you need to have to have the best outcome, to live the best life that you can have. And, and the main one with type two diabetes, um, is, is diet, right. you know, I mean, largely it's that we're eating too many calories all throughout the day. So put the fork down and, and, you know, people will say, well, we can't deny, you know, we can't deny diabetics certain foods or, you know, we can't deny them certain meals or whatever. And it's like, this is what I have to say. Either we deny them their chocolate cake, or we deny them their kidneys, their eyes and their feet. They can take a pick. And I'm not saying that you can't cheat every once in a while, but you got to understand, you know, what the um, ramifications are for that cheating long term. So here, here is where Sean and I stand very strongly. One of the first patients I ever saw die was a diabetic. And it was sad. We see that throughout our practice throughout time. We have friends, family. We have people in our community that we see that suffer from this. And the sad thing about it is they're not getting the answers that they need to actually help them. And, you know, when you see posts on social media about somebody having a heart attack and they're 47 years old or they're having, you know, kidney failure or they're having all these things, the sad thing about it is there's so many times it could have been preventable with lifestyle, absolutely, which didn't cost you thousands and thousands of dollars every month. It just cost you a choice, right? And I argue this with Sean a lot. I'm sure if you live as healthy as you can be, you're going to eat more of the things that you like, maybe on a smaller scale, but over time you get to enjoy that. So it's not like we don't have a dessert or we don't have a treat. It's just that we don't indulge in it over the point we have restrictions and we, and we, we live with it and we've both had dietary issues and lifestyle issues. So we understand that it's an everyday decision and small choices make a difference over time. And what are some other things you can do as a type one diabetic, as a type two diabetic to lower your insulin and increase and decrease your insulin resistance and make your insulin more effective that you're producing already fasting. Um, Janet and I practice fasting regularly. Um, we, we eat around our exercise. We eat around our workouts a lot, but we fast regularly for 24 hours, um, 20, 18 to 20 hours, sometimes more depending on our workout schedule. Um, and what's going to happen is that if your glucose is high as a type two diabetic, you're, you're going to produce more insulin and you can keep your insulin high. So just think about this. If you fast for 16 hours, um, your, your glucose is going to go down because you're not, it's not in your gut anymore. Your glucose level is going to go down and your insulin is going to go down, um, to follow that. So that's a great way to decrease your glucose and insulin levels. What's another way? Another way is to choose whether you're consuming sugars or not. So we, we base that around our activity and Sean likes to do, and we do some endurance things. So of course on those days or those times, that's when we will have something different in our diet. But most days we choose to have a higher protein um, calorie source for our, our meals. And that makes a huge difference from the side of what the American SAD diet recommends because that has the pyramid of, you know, as much sugar as you can at the bottom and then slowly building up to proteins and then fats. So we've kind of flipped that in our, our own diet and it's based on what we are doing and we make a conscious choice. And I understand that sometimes those decisions can be hard because when Sean's traveling, you might have some limitations, but then we make sure that, for example, Hey, you know, we know we're going to be, you know, on a plane or we're going to be traveling here or there. So what can we do to make sure that that is not just all carbs we choose to like, for example, eat a breakfast that has nutrients like from eggs and bacon or sausage. Yeah. And Janice says about eat around your workouts. Um, yep. Uh, it, that's, that's very important. Eat, eat around and, and not just answer your workouts, but your, but your movement, you know, we don't have to, we think of workouts as, you know, Oh, I rode a, I went to the gym for an hour or I rode a bike for an hour. And we think of that's the only workout, but you know, you have to understand that you can eat around, you know, for centuries, we would eat around our activities. So if we went hunting, 
to go kill an animal for our own food, um, you eat afterwards. I mean, after you hunt and it's successful, you cook it and you eat it and you gorge for maybe a few days. But then you have a few days off possibly with very little food, especially if it's in the winter and you don't have a lot stored. And that's okay. There again, what happens? Your insulin level, your glucose level goes down. Um, I think our bodies are well designed to fast for multiple days at a time, actually. And I think traditionally that's what we used to do because we didn't have refrigeration or freezer or um, a pantry full of food because we, we couldn't store it. Um, Definitely, we had ways to store food. There, you know, salt was a very uh, salt and drying meat was a way to preserve food. And um, in some, you know, you even look in some in uh, some cultures in um, or some uh, even hundreds just a hundred years ago. You know, in the Rocky Mountains, um, we kind of had refrigeration almost year round with ice. And what they would do, it's very interesting. Uh, what they would do is they would. Um, chop up a bunch of ice out of the river early, late in the spring when there was still ice and they would fill it. They would uh, put hay bales around it to insulate it and they would literally store their food and it, it would make it until August or September sometimes, which is pretty incredible when you think about that. Um, so it's not that we haven't stored food for many years, but but largely one of the problems with this, Janet said, the standard American diet or the SAD is that we typically have an unlimited food source when we get home. You know, our pantries are full of food, our freezers are full of food, and it makes it a lot more difficult to eat healthy. Um, I will tell you, my hardest time is not when I'm away from home, but at home, because it's so easy to just overeat because we have, we have a, an abundance of food in our house. Now, one of the ways that we help that is that we we um, try to have healthy foods in our house. So we have a mostly a meat diet um, and mostly it's frozen. So what does that mean? That means you have to prepare it ahead of time. You have to either thaw it out before you cook it or it takes longer to cook. So you have to prepare it. There's not, we don't have a lot of, you know, quote unquote, processed foods in our house where you just put it in the microwave and heat it up. We don't have a lot of those. So it makes it more difficult to overeat because you have to prepare everything. Um, and that we definitely, we just do not buy junk food. We don't buy chips. We don't buy, you know, cookies, things like that. And why? It's not because I wouldn't eat them because I would. And I mean, when I would eat them, I would eat a whole bag or a whole box of cookies. I still have a sweet tooth. And that's why I just don't, I just don't buy that stuff because I would be tempted to eat it. I, I don't have the willpower to, you know, eat just one or two. Um, I would, would eat the whole box. So um, another thing on carbohydrate metabolism and eating around workouts. Um, we, you know, for this, first 25 minutes of this podcast, I've, I've, we've been talking about glucose and how nasty it is. Now, I'm going to tell you that without glucose, we would die. Um, glucose is a, a simple sugar and it, it is the main way we fuel our bodies. Now, the, the ketosis people and um, the keto people, they will argue that till they're blue in the face. But the reality of it is, if we had a glucose of less than even 50 and 30, we would, if you have a glucose less than 30, we would starve our brain of glucose and you would literally pass out and you are on your way to death. So without glucose, we would die. Now, there's many ways we can make glucose in our body. Gluconeogenesis from one, um, glycogenolysis, which glycogen is stored in our liver and our um, quads, our quadricep muscles. And we have about 1,500 calories of glycogen um, ready to be cleaved cut into glucose um it's a it's a big glycogen it's a big glucose store is what it is we have 1500 calories of that um largely stored so think about that a pound and a half think about that um 1500 calories is um enough to sustain people for a day okay i mean you, largely if you're sed sedentary it could sustain you for a day um so what does that mean this is my opinion, and some people will argue about this, but I will tell you that it's what I do, and it works for me, and um, is, you know, people that 
I get a question often about, well, how much do I need to eat before workout and during a workout and after workout? It depends. That's that, that really depends on many factors. First of all, intensity, how intense is your workout? Second of all, length, length of the workout is, uh, it's not the most important, but remember we have 1500 calories to burn. Okay. In glycogen alone, which is a very ready, ready glucose store. Okay. So 1500 calories. Most people are never going to burn 1,500 calories in a workout. Now, the only time I burn 1,500 calories in a workout is that when I'm racing my bike at intensity for an hour and a half or more. I burn about 1,000 calories an hour, 1,200 if I'm going really hard, 1,200 an hour. Um, so that's when I will eat. That's when I will pre-fuel and I'll eat during and I will eat after. And I'll, I'll basically drink pure sugar water. So glucose is not bad. It fuels our body. It fuels our muscles. It fuels our brain um, if we're burning it, okay? So realize if you are one of those people that think you need to work out, you need to eat before workout, after workout, and during a workout, that's usually just not the case. So unless you're an endurance athlete where you're, where you're doing exercise for more than an hour and a half at a time um, at intensity, then you probably don't need to. Crossfitters, crossfitters would not necessarily need to fuel their bodies. Now, some would argue that they would, they, they would get better performance. I will tell you this. I think it's a mental thing um, because you, you're, you're getting enough calories from your, your glycogen um, stores um, and, of course, your fat stores. One of the things is too, is that it teaches you when you don't eat all the time, even with exercise, is it teaches your body to utilize fat. Now, here's where the keto, pe the ke uh, keto people um, really love to talk about how you need to train your bodies to utilize fat. First of all, there is some truth to that. Second of all, our bodies know how to do that already, okay? If your body didn't know how to utilize fat, it would be non-sustainable of life, okay? You would die. So all of our bodies know how to burn fat, glucose, glycogen at the same time. And there's not an on and off switch. So you don't just say, well, oh, I'm burning glucose now on. Oh, I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to burn fat. No, that is not reality. Our bodies are doing all of those processes all at the same time. Now, as you fast more, or as you burn through your glycogen and your glucose, you will utilize more fat. Now, breaking fat down into glucose is not as fast of energy store, um, as, fast, as fast of energy production as it is eating glucose or breaking down glucose from glycogen. It's not as fast. That's why as an endurance athlete, if you want good performance and you're going to intensity, you need to, you need to eat carbohydrates while you're doing it before and after and during. Um, but here's another, here's another example of what, what I want to tell you is that when you're eating carbohydrates at intensity, uh, at, at intense exercise, and you, let's say you're burning a thousand calories an hour, your, your blood flow, your body's is, is telling yourself, okay, I don't need digestion right now. I need all my, my nutrients, my fuel, the blood, all my energy or most of my energy to go into producing um, fuel for fuel and nutrients to make my strided muscles work. So make your big muscles work, make your brain work, make your vital things work and, and shut down digestion. So the reality of it is at intensity, when you're working out intensely, you can only absorb about 200, maybe 300 calories an hour um, from food. So to try to think that you can eat a thousand calories an hour is is crazy because you would you I, I've 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 eaten too many calories not a thousand but I've eaten too many calories at intense at intense level exercise and you can tell you're not digesting it and and you feel sick you feel like you want to puke it's it's a miserable feeling um, so that is when where are you getting those thousand calories an hour then well that's odd that should be kind of obvious you're getting it from your fat cells. We, our bodies are great at storing energy. That's why we have fat around our middle. We're good at storing energy. And when we have excess energy, we store it as fat. Not necessarily a bad thing. Going back to the hunters and gatherers I talked about, when you wouldn't eat for two or three days, it's good you had a fat storage, right? And most of us could fast for a month with our fat stores and, 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 and it would, it would not be too detrimental in our, in our, in our health. Um, that's how much fuel we have stored as fat. 
Now, I'm not necessarily saying that a 30 day fast would be would be uh, healthy, but most of us have plenty of fat for days and weeks at a time to be stored as energy. Now, would you want to be going out and doing intense exercise, fasting like that? No, absolutely not. But the whole point is we have a lot of stored energy because our bodies traditionally were good at storing it four times when we were in famine and we didn't have food. So. Um, so let's go over some tips of, of type two diabetes. Cause that's the one that we talk the most about, and it's the most prevalent in our society. It's epidemic in our society and, and diabetes, I would argue kills more people than anything because diabetes leads to cardiovascular disease, which kills more Americans than any, than, than anything more than car wrecks, more than cancers. So if you want to, if you want to increase your odds of living, of living, just living, um, don't have type two diabetes, and um, it will it will um, probably prevent cardiovascular disease. And type two diabetes is reversible. If your doctor tells you it's not reversible, go get a new doctor. And here's how here's how you can check this. Now, if you're on any medications that cause hypoglycemia, cause your blood sugar to get too low, do not do this. But if you don't think type two diabetes is reversible, here's here's what I ask: fast for 24 hours. Fast for 24 hours if you're not on any medication that causes your blood glucose to go too low and see what happens to your glucose. Of course, you know the answer. It's going to go down. That alone proves that type 2 diabetes is reversible because your diet just changed your glucose. And that, that's not a bad thing. You're not going to die from that if you're not on any medication. So let's go over some other things. So other things to do to, to uh, lower your blood glucose. Fast. That's one. And then um, eat low carbohydrates and then exercise. Because remember what exercise does. Exercise needs that glucose. Exercise will take that glucose and it will burn that glucose. That's why when I'm eating, when I'm working out intensely, I will drink pure sugar water um, because I'm burning the glucose. That's not necessarily a bad thing. So um, those are the basically the three tips to, to um, reverse your diabetes lower your blood glucose, lower your insulin. And overall, what is this about? It's about increasing your metabolic health and increasing your health in general long-term. So that about covers it. Please, um, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the comment section. We are streaming live on Twitter, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and um, Facebook. Uh, this is Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Uh, Monday, tune in to our regularly scheduled podcast, 12.30 to 1.30 Pacific Standard Time. I'm not sure who our guest is, but it's going to be a great one. So um, go to the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy YouTube channel and prescribe or subscribe. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of these episodes. And check us out on those other platforms, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. All right. Thank you for tuning in. Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you. Thank you.